This is Right From The Deep. I'm Karen Ball. And I'm Erin Taylor-Young. And this is the podcast from writers for writers, answering the question, why am I doing this? Right. As writers, editors, and a former literary agent, we're in the deep with you, encouraging you and equipping you to find your truest story in the deep places. Get our show notes and more, including a free audio download on how to safeguard your writer's heart at writefromthedeep.com. Hey, friends, here's what's happening at Right From The Deep. As always, thanks to all our patrons on Patreon. You help make this show possible. Yes, you do. And special thanks to our October sponsor of the month, Bobby Updegraff. Yay, Bobby! Yay, Bobby! Bobby has been a longtime supporter also of another ministry called Friends of Renacer, and that's an ecumenical support network for a home for abused, orphaned, and abandoned children in Honduras. And I love this. It's a ministry of presence, of praying, visiting, listening, encouraging, and helping financially. And you can find out more about them at friendsofrenacer.com. That's F R I E N D S O F R E N A C E R dot com. And now, here's, here's the, the show. show. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the deep. I'm glad you're here with us today. We have a guest. And Yay! of course, we'll let Karen introduce him. Nick Harris, and I've known him for low these many years. He's worked in the book industry for more than 30 years. He's an old man like we're old ladies. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> You're calling me old. <laughs> He's owned or managed both Christian and children's bookstores. He's written articles for several prominent publications, and he's authored 10 books, including Magnificent Prayer, which I love, and Power in the Promises. For 15 years, he served as senior editor at Harvest House Publishers, where he worked with several well-known fiction and nonfiction authors. And now he's a literary agent with WordSurf Literary. He's a popular speaker and teacher at writers conferences where I love to meet him when we're together at the conferences. And he loves to discover promising new writers. He and his wife, Beverly, an avid quilter, live in Oregon. Yay, Oregon! <laughs> and are the parents of three adult daughters and grandparents of two boys and two girls. Nick, welcome, welcome to the deep. Oh, thanks. It's great to be here. Yes, and let me just say, if you guys have never met Nick personally, it, he's just one of my favorite people. He's just the sweetest man ever. If you're ever, ever at a conference and you just need a father figure who's going to be <laughs> sweet and kind, find Nick. <laughs> so, yes. All right. So, Nick, our first question for you. Um, what does the deep mean to you? Well, I love that word, um, especially because the way I, I interpret it is deep writers from the past, like even a hundred years ago, have had an, uh, such an effect on my own spiritual life. One of my goals as a writer is to take some of the deep truths, just to go deeper than what most people are doing, and try to translate Andrew Murray, Watchman Nee, Hannah Whittall Smith, take what they said for their generation and make it fresh and new for our present generation. Mm. Because if you just tell somebody, I'm, I'm writing a book that's really deep, <laughs> and them off, you know, that's not something you want to do. But if you present the deep truths in a way that people can understand how that will change their life, then you're on to something. So that's my goal when I think about writing for the deep, writing from the deep, is writing from the deep that uh, I've received from some of the people I mentioned and, and many others. You should see my library of some of the deep writers of the past, um, many of whom I honestly wonder if they could be published today. Hmm. So that's what it means to me. Wow, I love Very. it. Karen and I were just talking about Charles Spurgeon because he right. had a we when in our in our reading uh, from Streams in the Desert he was in there and we were talking about that deep thinkers and deep writers and uh, so oh, yeah, he's great. Yeah, one reason I don't use him when I say uh, he might might not be able to be published today was he had the P word. He had the platform. Yeah. <laughs> back, even back then, platform was an issue, and and you know so much of what he accomplished was because of his uh, tremendous popularity uh, in his church uh, and in England. Wow. So he had the platform. There you go. Nowadays, well, some of the writers that don't have the platform, I wonder, you know, how how they'll make it. Right. And that's, yeah. honestly, you know, uh, when I do go to conferences, one of my most popular 
uh, workshops is what to do when you don't have a platform. And, and that's mm. getting increasingly hard to teach, but there are still ways. God makes a way when when he's in it, when he's um, compelling writers to write what he's put on their heart. Uh, right. There will be a way. I have a good friend who I saw on Facebook that she was dealing with discouragement and that sometimes this publishing gig is hard, she said. And I thought, you know, the thing we always need to keep our focus on is the fact that if God has given us this task to write, he'll prepare the way and he'll accomplish what he wants to accomplish, whether that means getting published or not. He'll accomplish his purposes in what we do in obedience to what he's given us to do. So it is hard and it's crushing and it can take you out with your ego. But if you keep your focus on the master, then it it means that what you need to be careful about and focused on is being obedient. And that's pretty much the extent of your responsibility there. Right. Yes. And, you know, when you mentioned the word focus, it, it reminded me that some writers are all over the map with what they want to write. And to be focused as a writer is a big help. A lot of people cringe at the idea of having a, a mission statement for their writing. But, you know, a while back, I, I just thought, well, now, what, who do I write to? Who's my audience? And at first I thought, well, okay, I know it, it's to hurting Christians. I write for hurting Christians. And then mm. then God reminded me, wait a minute, he, he edited me. <laughs> he said, no, you write for hurting people. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of my focus. And I think being a writer with focus really helps you stay on the track. Uh, and at least you know where you're going. Right. Wow. Let's dig a little deeper into that a little bit, Nick. Um, you personally, because, you know, here you are, you're an editor, you've worked at a bookstores and that kind of thing, but you're also a writer. What has driven you personally? What has called you personally to write? Well, you know, like so many writers, I can go back to my childhood. I remember at age eight, I wrote my first short story. <laughs> um, very unpublishable. <laughs> Then in fifth grade, I remember a bunch of friends and I got together and we all decided we were going to write a book. So we each wrote a chapter. (laughs) Of course, none of it slowed together. It was awful. But then in high school, you know, I continued to prefer English classes to some of the other classes I took, especially math and science classes. But then in college, um, one of my first jobs was uh, in, in the county library. I worked for the library as I worked my way through college, and then uh, uh, stayed with that for quite a while after I graduated and into married life. Then I I started working for Zondervan Family Bookstores, and that was more than 40 years ago. Mm. So it's just been a chain of events that uh, I feel like in retrospect, when I look at what God has done, it's sort of amazing to me how open doors happened when I would not have expected them. And many times when I prayed for a specific thing to happen, it didn't happen. <laughs> and, you know, I would be discouraged. Where are you, God? Why, why aren't you <laughs> answering a prayer? And then, you know, six months later, unexpectedly, an opportunity would arise that just blew me away. Wow. Um, and it's sort of been that way for most of my life. Even my wonderful years at Harvest House came about, not because I applied for a job there, but because there was an opening. And uh, Terry Glassby, good old Terry, asked me if I'd be interested in applying. I, 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 it was just, it was out of the blue. Right. So God opens doors. We just have to believe that if we're going to pursue writing, we have to believe that God sees the future. He uses the past. And don't be discouraged if the, if the present doesn't look as glowing as you wish it did. Wow. I was just telling Aaron that I was working on something and a quote that Francine Rivers said that I'm sure she got from another source because the quote itself has been around for a long time is don't doubt in the darkness what God has done in the light. And we, we are so inclined. We're like my dogs. My husband was just talking to my dogs this morning. He had just fed them. They had had their breakfast, and they're right over trying to convince him that he didn't feed them, that they are starving to death. And, he, and, and also, our other little dog brought the ball to him to play with them while I'd been here in the office. And, and he said, I played with you for a half hour. Are you kidding me? And I looked at him and I said, yeah, but what have you done for me now? 
Right. And too many of us are like that with God. Okay, yes, you've opened all these doors, but what are you going to do for me now, God? Wow. I love, though, the idea of the patience for the six months. I, I mean, I think it's really easy to give up if you don't see what you want to see in the next day or right. the next week. Right. Or, you know, I think about um, even in the Bible, there was a point in time where um, Jeremiah, the prophet, was praying to God and saying, you know, here's all these exiles after the governor gets um, executed and they want to go to Egypt. But, you know, they asked me to ask you, should we be going to Egypt? Should we be fleeing basically from the Babylonians coming for this repercussion? And, you know, it takes 10 days for that answer. And you have to be like, well, God knew the answer right away. But why didn't he tell him? Well, because he's God, you know, and because that answer was supposed to come in 10 days. For whatever reason, I think it's easy to question God's timing and God's purposes in that. And really, he just wants us to be faithful and to wait expectantly. Yeah, exactly. You know, Aaron, you went through that yourself in looking for your home yes. there in Kansas City. yes looking and looking and waiting and waiting and not feeling like, why is this taking so long? Feeling like, why doesn't this seem like the right house? What What is going on? And wondering if there was a right house and wondering if we're being too picky. And yet there was something in my spirit that just, we just couldn't, we just couldn't bid on certain houses and on other ones that we were close on, there was already three other bids. So it was like, well, that, that went away. And now, you know, this place, this particular house that we ended up with has had its challenges, but oh my goodness, it's, it's right here in nature. And I just, I can't, I tell Alan, my husband, I can't, keep telling him, I can't believe I get to live here. I can't believe I get to live here. So months, you know, <laughs> and by the way, we were supposed to move in, you know, like months earlier, we were supposed to, we had a different house and it all fell through when our home sale in Oklahoma fell through. So it's like, you wonder, you know, that was quite the hardship. <laughs> and you think God isn't leading you. God isn't leading you. But he is, even through difficult, difficult circumstances. So I'm much happier in this house than I would have been in the house that we thought we needed to buy because we thought our house was sold. But it, you know, unbeknownst to us, God knew that it was going to fall through. We didn't. So there you go. Wait and wait and be patient. Yep, that's true. I'm, I'm, my next book is coming out uh, in 2022, and it's a book that I've been praying about and knew was from the Lord two years ago, but it's taken a, at least a year and a half to find an interested publisher and be offered a contract for it. So all that time, of course, like any writer, I was thinking, God, did I hear you right? So yeah, now it's finally coming to pass. So yeah. just be patient. Those are the times when we question our marching orders, you know, just we get these marching right. orders. And then if we don't hear this constant reinforcement, we question it when really God's like, I told you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Don and I, for a long time, our mantra was God's in control. I don't get it. I may not like the way that things are going, but God's in control. And that came out of so many things pulling the rug out from under us, so many things we thought we could rely on. And it's like all these things that we, we knew were leading us where God wanting us, but then they wouldn't work out the way that we wanted them to. So I've come to the place now when things don't work out, Aaron would call me and say, you know, you're not going to believe this. The house sale fell through and we can't get this house. And I just kept saying, God knows. <laughs> God has the right place for you and you just need to lean into him in the midst of it. Right. Yep. Amen. So, Nick, what what do you think? I mean, as as a former editor for the publishing company for so long, and as an agent now, um, we've already kind of talked about some advice. But what other specific advice might you have for writers? And I would want to know both spiritually and professionally. So you could start with one or the other. But this is obviously a difficult publishing climate. So, what would you want to say to writers right now? To be successful as a writer, it seems like there are three things you have to do. You have to have good ideas for books that will meet the needs of people. 
you have to be able to promote that book, and you have to have writing ability. And oftentimes, writers may have one or two of these uh, going for them, but they lack the third and uh, whatever it is. For me, in looking at manuscripts, the hardest one of the three, I think, is actually being a really good writer, and that takes practice. It takes, for me, it took classes. Even though I, ma- you know, in college I majored in English, I minored in journalism, learned how to write economically through my journalism classes. Uh, <laughs> I had to, you know, in my twenties and thirties, I would take just single classes from adult ed or or from the community at the community college and just learning over and over again, every month reading the writer or writer's digest, just immersing myself in trying to become a better writer. So I I think of the three that I mentioned, uh, if a person can concentrate on their writing always, you know, now that I'm in my seventies, I'm, I know that I will be trying to perfect my writing till my dying day. Wow, it's right. not something you ever have arrived at. You just keep going at it. If marketing is your weak point, and that is my weak point, uh, you just do what you know to do. Uh, there's always a next step, and I believe God reveals the next step, the next thing you're supposed to do. If you're really called to be a writer, I think getting great ideas for books is something that will uh, almost come naturally. One of the quotes I use when, in my workshops at conferences is the Wayne Gretzky quote. He was a great hockey player. and he would, Somebody asked him why he was so successful, and he said, well, other hockey players go where the puck is. I go where the puck is going next. Mm-hmm. And I think if writers can visualize a year or two ahead, what what's happening that will be impacting people a year or two from now? I mean, if, if a writer two years ago could say, hmm, you know, I wonder what would happen if there were a pandemic to come along or, uh, you know, just whatever. The, the ideas are out there. And I think if you're going to be a writer, be a catcher of ideas. And not every idea will be one that has your name on it, but a lot of them will. Hmm. And that, those are the ones you need to follow up on and say, can I write this? Is there a market for this? And then go for it. Uh, don't be discouraged if you don't get some no's along the way and be willing to pull the plug on the idea if you if you come to the place where you say okay I, i'm losing my interest in this the or uh, the i can see that the, the public is not going to be looking for this in the next year or two uh you just don't be discouraged when you have to cut loose some ideas and go to the next one i, I have a list on my computer of 54 book ideas, and if I get to do five of them before I leave the planet, I'll be happy. <laughs> Those ideas, I almost every month I shift, you know, number idea number five, I think, oh, gosh, that's really timely. I'm going to move that up to number two. And all the time I'm working on the proposals for the, the ones that are, say, in my top five or ten, sometimes something will happen and I'll say, oh, man, that's a lousy idea after all. And it'll go from number five to number 54. Real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but just, uh, you know, trying to be proactive as a writer. A lot of people who don't succeed as writers do it as a hobby. And I think, you know, maybe that'll work for you, but I think it lessens your chances. You really need to think of your of writing as your calling, as an assignment from God, as your mission from God, and be serious about it. Plow ahead uh, and, and do what's necessary. Improve your writing craft, learn marketing skills, and go to conferences if you know, when they start up again. Nowadays, there are conferences that are online mostly, but there are still good Christian writers' conferences to be had. Listen to podcasts like uh, Rise from the Deep, and I encourage writers to check out the blogs of agents and other successful writers and editors. Just immerse yourself in the industry. Know what uh, what's out there. Those are all the things that I think are ingredients for success as a writer. Mm-hmm. Professionally, yeah. 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 So how about how about spiritually? Yeah, spiritually, I, that's sort of the key. I, you've, I think you've got to be called. You've got to know uh, and be sensitive. Let me give you an example. The, the book I'm working on now is a devotional for Christians in recovery 
from substance abuse or, or whatever. It's like it's like my my one minute prayers uh, for those with cancer. It's it's a book that I wish there was no market for, but right. unfortunately, there's a huge market for it. Well, let me tell you how, briefly how that began. Uh, actually, I had been at OCW Oregon Christian Writers Conference in Portland. On my way home, I stopped to see my daughter who lives in Portland, and we went to Starbucks, and I. It was a walk-up Starbucks, and the fellow in front of me was a young man in his early 20s, and he was obviously on some drug. Hmm. He made his order, and then he turned around to me, and he handed me his Starbucks gift card, and he said, here, do you want this? It's got a couple dollars left on it. And I, I thanked him and said, no, I, you, you go ahead. Use it next time you're here. And he said, no, if you don't take it, I'm going to throw it away. So I took it, and I thanked him, and it, it was at that moment that I thought, I just felt just a well of compassion for this young man. And then within the next 48 hours, with uh, there were two or three other instances where I came across somebody who obviously uh, was under the influence of some sort of substance. Uh, there was some substance abuse in life. And putting two and two together and combining it with this compassion that I felt for that young man, I thought, oh, how can these people be helped? How can God help these people? God, would you let me try to write a book on that? And out of that has come the proposal and now the offer from Tyndale House. So um, I'm doing it. And it's like a year and a half later, two years later, but I'm excited about it. And I'm ex- I pr- as far as the spiritual aspect of it, I pray now for those future readers of that book. Mm-hmm. I still pray for the readers of the One Minute Prayers for those with cancer. Mm-hmm. Every day I try to pray for my readers, wherever they are, that God would bless them. I just posted on Facebook yesterday, uh, One Minute Prayers, uh, when you need a miracle. A, a lady had sent in to my publisher, Harvest House, that a nurse had given her that book when her husband was in the hospital for a heart condition. And unfortunately, he passed away just last Sunday, but she was so blessed by the book that she ordered 12 more copies. They forwarded that message to me, and it's like, thank you, Lord. It's validation. It's confirmation. It's motivation to write more and just to believe God for greater impact. Um, I'm not a household name, and I never will be, but God seems to be able to cover that, you know, to, to make to make sure that the right people get my books. And that's my prayer daily, too, is that my books will get into the hands of people that really need them and and their lives will be changed because of them. Wow. I love that. That's having the right motivation. That's having the motivation of writing to serve and to help and to bless rather than writing with the motivation of I'm going to make lots of money at this right. because that that doesn't happen that often in publishing. Well, but, I, but yeah, that's that's powerful. And it's nice because this is something that writers can do every day, even if they're yes. not published yet. I mean, you can pray for future readers. You can pray for people you want to reach. You can pray for maybe you have seven books out there. You can pray for people that are getting those books. And I think it keeps you connected with your passion for people. It keeps you connected to the whole point. But I want to circle back just for a minute and say, um, I really do like what you said, though, Nick, about it's okay to also give up ideas and to, you know, maybe we had a passion for a particular idea. And that doesn't mean that that's the book that has to be your path to publication or even published at all. You can be like, you know what, I've, I've kind of lost my passion for that particular topic. But some people may feel a little bit trapped like that, like, oh, no, I have to keep doing this book because that's what God called me. Well, maybe that was just how you got into writing. Maybe that was just the idea that sparked you. You. So it's okay if you've prayed about it, it. I mean, it's okay to let go of some of those ideas and move on to something else that might be a new passion. So I, I love that freedom that uh, you give to writers to do that. Well, I do. But you know, honestly, when I cut loose of an idea, I don't totally cut loose. What I do is I move it to the bottom of the list. It right. becomes number 54 because I've discovered that Two or three years later, something might happen either within me or circumstantially uh, in the outer, you know, in the world that I think, now, wait a minute, maybe it's time to give that another go. So I never really fully kill off an idea, 
But I right. just say this is on the back burner for now. Maybe forever it'll be on the back burner. But um, be willing to just put it aside uh, for now. And there are, honestly, there have been a few times where God has told me, no, you're not going to write yeah, that book. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And, and so I have to be obedient to that. No matter how much I may want to, I just know that that's not for me. Right. Well, Nick, it's been such a delight to have you here with us, and clearly you've got more to say, so clearly we need to have you come visit us again sometime. Um, do you have any final words of wisdom or encouragement for our listeners today? I guess I would just say, you know, be persistent in prayer yes. uh, and persistent in your writing and be willing to say, God, if you do not want me to be a writer, make that plain, just as if you were praying, God, if you want me to be a writer, make that plain. I think there are people who would like to write, but honestly, God may have something other for them to do. Just be very confident of your assignment from God. And if it is writing, praise the Lord and just do the things that you know to do. Go to online conferences or in-person conferences when they happen. Read the blogs. Improve your craft the best way you can, either by taking local classes, reading books. I hope aspiring writers or even successful writers have, and you probably both do, at least a bookshelf full of your favorite writing books, whether it's <laughs> yeah. Bird by I Bird by Anne Lamont or Stephen two. King on writing. Right. There are just some excellent resources out there. And just stay, fall in love with with your assignment from God if you're called to be a writer, because it's a great, great calling. Right. Amen. Amen. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nick. Oh, happy to do it. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks for joining us today. You can find previous episodes and more resources at writefromthedeep.com. And I bet you know someone who needs this podcast, so please share it with them. So until next time, embrace the deep. Your writing and your life will never be the same. Mm-hmm.